This morning we continue our series that we're looking at right now about gaining victory over our past as a Christian. You know, God is a way maker. He wants us to understand that He has released us from our past. He's released us from all the baggage that it brings along. We're no longer tied to that in any way. The passage we're looking at this morning is from the book of Exodus. And when we're looking at the book of Exodus and we're thinking about what it shows, we've got the people of Israel, or the children of Israel, the, the Hebrew children, have been enslaved. Pharaoh has dominated their life. They're living in the horror of slavery. But yet, God, through the plagues, breaks the power of Egypt and releases his people. They go out, they get to the Red Sea, and God says, go forward. <laughs> go forward where? How? You know what? I want you to understand something. Our God doesn't need you to, or me to understand the how. He just needs us to do what he calls us to do. Because when he said go forward and Moses began to move forward and, and Moses did what God wanted him to do, the sea just parted. And when you've got a, a million people trying to cross the sea, it's not, it's not a little narrow path. It's a wide path. It's dry ground. And they get on the other side. But crossing through the sea wouldn't be enough. So God did something else. So let's look, beginning at verse 26 of chapter 14. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may come back over the Egyptians, over their chariots and their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak, while the Egyptians were fleeing right into it. Then the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, even Pharaoh's entire army that had gone into the sea after them. Not even one of them remained." But the sons of Israel walked on the dry land through the midst of the sea, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, and believed in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. Listen, I think God had the people, you know, they were, where are they headed? When they came out of slavery, where were they heading? The promised land. Do you know that between Egypt and the promised land, they didn't have to go through the sea. They didn't have to go through the water at all. It's a pretty quick trip, a pretty easy trip. But Moses following God's direction ends up at a place that's a trap, a beach with a million people and only one way in and no way out. And Egypt with its armies pursuing. Why in the world would God put them in this position? And then why would he have them move through the sea? I think it was a purpose that God had to separate them from their past. To show them once again. I mean, they'd already seen his power in overthrowing ten different types of gods in Egypt. They'd already seen that. Now, they're seeing a different level. So, they're clearly separated from their past. Their captors are no longer the captors. They're destroyed. At least all that entered the water 
are destroyed. They would never go back to the same Egypt even if they went back. I want us to understand that today God does that for us. He helps us break free of our past. He puts us through issues in our life and through things where we can decide, d d clearly see that he is at work. But the hard thing is, is that just like the Hebrew children struggled to apply that principle to their daily life, we sometimes strive or, or struggle with that in our own life. Because it, it wouldn't be too long after this <laughs> that the people would begin to question whether or not it would be better to be back in Egypt. Now listen. You, you just think about it. Nehemiah, when he's rebuilding the wall and he's recounting the faithlessness of the people. He talks about the fact that they refused to listen. They didn't remember. They were stubborn. And they appointed leaders to arrange everything so they could go back to Egypt. But Nehemiah reminds them that the God of forgiveness of graciousness, of compassion, is slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and does not forsake his people. Wow! What a powerful message of hope that God gives us. You see, Nehemiah was referring to an event in Numbers chapter 14 where the people had decided... Let's choose a leader. we got to go back to Egypt. You know what? Here's what I want us to understand. There are times in our own lives we want to go back over the bridges, back to our past, because it's easier. We didn't have any responsibility then. We weren't aware of things then. We, we weren't in the same situation then. We feel like it's, we, we glamorize it in some way. Why is it that we glamorize our past, even when it was bad? I mean, can you imagine saying to your children, oh, I am so horrified that we're out here following God. I just wish we were back in Egypt sitting under the slavery and the tyrannical rule of Pharaoh. I wish we didn't have any decisions we were responsible for. I wish we didn't have any things we had to do. I wish we didn't have to follow this God. We look at that and say, that would be absolutely ridiculous. Until we start looking at our own life. And realizing there are things in our past that we long for that were brutal to us. Destructive to us. And we fantasize. Listen, folks. There are some things in our past we need to destroy the bridges to. Now, there's some things in your past, in my past, that are wonderful. Memories that are wonderful. Events that are wonderful. People that are wonderful. It's okay to keep those bridges. But you know and I know that there are bridges to our past we need to destroy. And this morning, I want us to think about four of those bridges specifically. First, I want us to think about, I need to allow God to destroy my bridge to ungodly possessions. What do you have that you don't need to have? I don't know what it is. I've not been in most of your homes. But what do you have? You know, as, as we realize it, as a believer, we cannot serve two masters. 
We are either serving God or we are serving someone else. And when we have those possessions in our, in our presence, all of a sudden we begin to go kind of wishy-washy on our commitment to God. Oh, but, you know, what, what are they? Think about three different categories that you may have. You, you, ha- you may have something in your home that you know is easily recognized as something that definitely is evil because it always distracts you from God. I had someone this week, they they made a comment to me. They said, Pastor, I've been listening to different preachers. I've been listening to you. I've been listening to other people. And sometimes they'll say, you know, why, why do you keep listening to the same negative information all the time? And I realized that I finally, two months ago, had to turn that off. And he said, you know, my life has been so much more peaceful since I turned that off. What are you listening to? What are you looking at? What are you dealing with in your life? Some of you have idols in your home. I know you're a believer. And and you may say, well, this is just a a replica of something in my past. This is just something I can't throw away because it belonged to mother. I can't, can't do that. Listen, does it honor God? Does it point to Jesus? Is it a possession that is possessing you in a way that is bringing you to the feet of Jesus Christ and thanking him for his love for you? Or is it something that's hinting to you every day, Jesus may not be all he says? You need to get rid of it. When we were in Africa and working there, we knew when a family gave their life to Christ, one of the ways we knew that it was for real is they would burn their idol hut. Now, you may be sitting there going, oh, but that's that's not that big of a deal. But it is. It is. Listen to what Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 15 says. Cursed is the man who makes an idol or a molten image an abomination to the Lord. The work of his hand, the work of the hands of a craftsman sets it up in secret and all the people shall answer and say, Amen. You think about it. The psalmist says, hey, listen, these are, these are things made by hands that can't speak, they can't see, they can't hear, they can't smell, they can't feel, they can't walk, they can't make a sound with their throat, but yet we call them gods. But the psalmist says, if you hang on to that, you will become exactly what it is. Totally empty. Burn the bridge to those. Destroy the bridge. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. Is what Jonah would say. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 14 says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Now here's, here's the thing. Sometimes we look at this and we go, Wow, yeah. I don't have an idol in my house. Just because you don't have an idol in your house doesn't mean you're not in idolatry. You see, there is a difference. The Lord says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys where thieves can't break in or steal for where your heart is or where your treasure is, there is your heart also. If there are things in your home that are taking your heart away from Jesus, they are your idol. It could be your bank account. (laughs) Is your bank account focused on God or is it focused on on you. Listen, some of you, when we walked through our building process, you know, we, we, we were 
asking you to pray and ask God what you would give and how you would be committed to that. And you put down on paper, this is what God gave me. This is the number God gave me. And some of you have never given a dime toward it. Let me ask you this. What did you not understand about your gift was to God? And you know what you're doing? You're allowing Satan to have the upper hand in your life. You didn't write that number and say, I'm giving this to the church. Because we ask you to ask what God wanted and how he would provide and what he would do. Why would you not trust God? So I want to ask you, what's happening in your mind? What's happening in your heart? There's, there's another category. There's something that creates a stumbling block for you. It may be okay for somebody else. Matt may can do it. Sangu may can do it. Someone else may can do it. But for me, it creates a stumbling block. It's something that God has given me a conviction about. And listen, one of the things we need to understand as believers, we don't need to look at another believer and say, that's a crazy conviction that you have. If God has given them that conviction, don't push them to give it up. They may eventually give it up, or they may come deeper with it. But let God be the one that does that. You know what? We need to understand that there are things in our lives that are dangerous, and we need to just let them go. A third category is there are things that are seen as not bad, but they don't necessarily point to Jesus or lift him up at all either. And you know what? I find that as people follow Jesus Christ, this bridge is destroyed on its own pretty easily because we begin to recognize that we want to focus on Christ. So think about the possessions you have and destroy the bridge there because God is wanting you to be free to live in the now. The second area I want us to think about is I need to allow God to destroy the bridge to unhealthy relationships. You see, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. The Bible lets us know that. We need to evaluate our friendships. We need to evaluate our relationships. We need to evaluate them based on what God's Word says. You know, some of you are dating, but God's not a part of that. I mean, you're just looking for somebody. Let me tell you what. The Bible says a non-believer and a believer have no reason whatsoever to get married. Oh, but I know of many, many people that the husband is a Christian or the wife is a Christian and the other is not. Many of those are set like that after marriage in the sense that they both were non-believers when they were married and then one became a believer. But God says intentionally as a Christian, you should not seek out a non-Christian to marry. Why? It creates all kinds of issues that you don't need because of spiritual growth. Oh, but there's not any good Christian men out there and there's not any good Christian women out there. Then convert them. That's what you and I are supposed to be doing anyway, taking the hope of Jesus Christ to our world. Oh, but I'll get him saved after I get married. No. You know what? The numbers are against you there. Because his mindset is if you'll, if you'll marry a lost person, you'll live with him without any problem. You know what? You know what, folks? Lead them to Christ. You don't have to do like I did. I mean, you've heard me say that on my first date with any girl, I always ask her her testimony. And I have had times when I stopped my car and turned around before we got where we're going because I knew I wasn't going to date with a girl. Now, you, you look at that and you go, that's ridiculous. That was my conviction. But here's the reality. God says, be careful who you are with. 
Not only in a marriage situation, but in a partnership, in a friendship. You want to start a friendship with a relationship pointing to Jesus. I've got many friends that I've started friendships with that are non-believers, but they know when I start that friendship that I'm sharing with them about Jesus. And then I'll continue the friendship, and later on I'll share with them about Jesus. And we'll continue. And, and some of them are totally confused. Why would you even like me? Because Jesus loves you. But we need to have the right relationship there. Listen, we need the right kind of friends. We need to actively build the relationships to the right kind of friends. It, in Proverbs 17, 17, it says, A friend loves at all time, and a brother is born for adversity. So a friend loves at all times. Listen, God loves us. And this is something hard for people to understand. But listen, one of the beautiful things is God calls me because I have a relationship with him, and God calls you because you have a relationship him, with him, a friend. Listen to John chapter 15, verse 15. No longer do I call you slaves, for a slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. Now, I can tell you this from the experiences that I see many, many different Christians face. Many of the friends you have before you accept Jesus Christ will disappear after you accept Jesus Christ just naturally. Because they don't want to be around you. Because your dreams change, your hopes change, your purpose changes your understanding of love changes. Your understanding of truth changes. Everything changes. And honestly, there are people that you think would never, ever leave you that will leave you. Be a person that loves like Jesus, though. Start out letting people know about Christ. Build that relationship strong. Be a loyal friend. Work through times of struggle, through times of difficulty with them. You know, many of us have friends that are with us when we're going good, but when things go bad, where do they go? Be a friend like Jesus. But look at your friendships, assess your friendships, assess your relationships, your business partnerships, your dealings, and then think through, is this a bridge that God wants me to destroy? And if it's yes, God's going to give you a new bridge that's going to be much better. Third bridge, allow God to destroy my bridge to personal appearance. This is something of interest. You know, style. Satan lies to us all the time about this. He says, dress for success because you're not enough. Make sure you dress a certain way so that people will notice who you are because they wouldn't notice you any other way. They wouldn't notice you for your skills. They wouldn't notice you for your brains. They wouldn't notice you for your love. They wouldn't notice you for other things. So you've got to dress apart. You've got to act apart. If you want to fit in, you've got to have the right color fingernails. You, you've got to have the, the, the earring on the right right place. You, you've got to have the right kind of clothing to fit in. You know, and I don't know what group you're trying to fit into, but if your appearance and your, your deal is to try and seek the approval of someone instead of God, then folks, we're in the wrong place with our thought process. Also, there are many women who, 
if I don't, if I don't dress seductively, I'll never have a husband. Another lie from Satan. Listen, in our walk, in our life, we need to remember some things. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. What you do, how you look, how you act, what you, where you go in that, Think about, does this glorify God? If it does, great. But you know, Hebrews tells us to make sure we lay aside every weight that ensnares us, every state, that, everything that causes us to stumble. Lay those things aside. But here's another thing we need to think about. Paul tells us we need to think about other believers also. What's going to help them grow in their faith? Oh, who cares about them? You should care about them. Paul would say, you know, listen to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12 and 13. And so, by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it's weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. Now, is Paul saying eating meat is sinful? Absolutely not. Matter of fact, if you're going to be a biblical Jew, then you would absolutely have to eat meat. There's no such thing as a vegan Jew. You know, when we look at it, Paul says, hey, but here's the issue. If someone is offering meat to the temple that's an idol, and then that meat is sold in the market for you and I to buy, do we buy that? There were some believers that would sit there and look and say, there's no God there. So all they did is have an expensive barbecue, and they're, they're selling it now for a cheap price, and it's good meat. Whereas somebody else would look at it and say, look, that's evil because it was sanctified and, and set apart for our God. And, and so now if, if we eat it, we're, we're condoning that and it's, and it's a problem. And, and Paul says, listen, honestly, there's nothing wrong with it because there's only one God, period. But if it causes your brother to stumble, I would never eat meat again. Now, you may go, well, what in the world does that have to do with dress? I was totally shocked one time as a young pastor. I had a young, uh, had a, there was a, not a young man, an older man that came up to me. I mean, I was probably 19, 20 years old. This older gentleman was nearing 80. And he says, preacher... I wish these young ladies wouldn't dress so pornographically. I may be old, but I still know a good body. And it causes me to go in the wrong direction with my thoughts. Wow. You know, some of you women would fuss at your husband for viewing pornography, but then you'll dress pornographically. Because you want somebody else to notice how fit you are and how wonderful you're shaped. Listen, folks. Be thinking about how fit I am for Jesus and how wonderfully thrilled he is to have a relationship with me. The last bridge I want us to think about is the bridge to our past memories. As I said earlier, some of our memories of the past are wonderful. Hang on to those. Cherish those. Those are great to have. You don't have to burn all the bridges. You don't have to destroy them all. But if memories that you are hanging on to 
that are flooding back into your mind is leading you towards sinful behavior or is leading you to fantasize about something being better than it really was. I mean, can you imagine them fantasizing that being, <laughs> being hungry, being thirsty, being fearful in the, in the land of Egypt as their slaves was better than being fed all you needed every day, being able to have clothes that never wore out, being able to have the protection of God. Do you realize for 40 years they absolutely 100% lacked for nothing? And in the midst of lacking for nothing, they're longing for a broken past. I want to ask you, what drives you and me to cherish our broken past? Well, I want you and I to understand God created us as new creatures. And he says, not only did I create you to be new, you need to act new. You need to be new. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 18 and 19 says, Do not call to mind the former things and ponder the past. Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. And then Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. That in reference to your old or to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance to the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and the holiness of truth. The challenge is for us to recognize that when Jesus liberated us from our past, he did away with it. It no longer has the same hold over us. But at the same time, we choose every day, just like the Hebrew children did, to either keep our eyes on God or to wish for something we're fantasizing about back there that we don't need. Ask God, God, help me understand I am created new. I am to pursue righteousness. I am to pursue holiness. I am to pursue your truth. And help me understand that when I entered into the relationship to you, it was just like when those Hebrew children entered the Red Sea. They entered as slaves, exited as free. Help me remember that. I'm not held by all that's around me. You are the way maker. Help me, Lord, to depend on walking with you. This morning, for some of you, you're struggling with that simply because You've never really given your life to Christ. You come to church. You read your Bible. You hope for the best. But you're not allowing God to have his way. 
I ask you this morning, would you just allow Jesus, who died for you, to pay for your sin, to restore your life, and to give you honor, to allow you to be back in that honored relationship with the Father, would you give your life to him? And say, Lord, (laughs) I can't do this on my own. I can't do it on my own. None of us. But when we give it to him, notice the thing I said is, I need to allow God to destroy my bridge. Notice I didn't say, I butch Tanner will. Because I can't. But today, would you allow God to work in that? For many of you here as believers, you've already figured out multiple things that are wrong with my sermon this morning. You've already come up with multiple reasons why certain aspects of it will not or should not be applied to your own life. I challenge you to go to God with it. See what God has to say about it. And then follow Him. Let's pause a moment and think through just a moment and then we'll pray. Lord Jesus, we all experience those times in our life where we would rather go back to the life we left because of some fantasy that we've uh, applied to it or other things. But Lord, we call on you today to not empower us to do anything. We call on you today, just like you opened up the sea, you closed the sea. Help us, Lord, to be able to close the sea. I mean, allow you to close the sea to those things in our past. Help us establish new ways. Help us build new bridges. Help us, Lord to walk in a way that honors you. May we understand the importance of applying your truth. In Jesus' name.